the the time will be back for for today for the kind of things that will show um so this mini workshops this series of mini workshops that we've been, been following um in the last months uh, the idea is to be very interactive that you uh, uh, execute a little bit the, the the kind of things that i will propose for for today uh, so <coughs> we will be using our cluster uh, so I will demonstrate how it, I imagine that all of you, I, I don't know if, if it's written in, in the word in the email, uh, it's expected that you have an account with us. If you don't have an account with us, you can still follow uh, a little bit passively uh, the ideas, um, but you can request an account on, on our cluster. There is no charge for that. So feel free to, to uh, open the ticket and request an account on our clusters. Um, Today, I will be presenting um, a little bit of an exploration about Spark, uh, how Spark is used for uh, big data, data analysis, and machine learning in a scalable way. So the, this is the natural package that you expect to, to use if you are, are using <coughs> a, a large infrastructure like our cluster uh, for, for data analysis. So uh, this is the natural. Uh, software to use in this case. So, and we will be, use, <coughs> be using this uh, very interactively. So, the first thing is to connect, let me see, uh, I, will, I will go here. <coughs> and <coughs> sorry, I've been coughing. Uh, I, I got COVID recently, so I'm still trying to survive with this. Um, so let's start with this. Okay, so the first step for today is to go to this website on demand. So something like this on demand. Well, uh, <coughs> I will copy this on our uh, on here. Uh, yes, okay. So Daniel, copy that. Uh, yes. You can request an account, just go to that the website, help desk. Uh, if you are the WVU uh, student, faculty, staff, um, you can register there, uh, enter with the, your credentials and make the request. Otherwise, for external people, there, there is another link uh, for requesting the account. So this is the website. Once you get an account on Thorny Flat, you can use open on demand uh, for interactive execution on our cluster. <coughs> so this is the website uh, on demand. The first thing uh, I will do was go to this website. Uh, as I already was working on, on, on the machine, it just put me right in front of my on the dashboard. Otherwise you will have to put the duo, your password, blocking password duo, and you will land on this on this on this page. Now, uh, we will execute <coughs> a Jupyter notebooks that I already prepared for you. So the first thing is for you to get a copy of those, the notebooks, the data, all that. Uh, so one way of doing that is to Okay, click here on clusters and click here on Thorny Flat Share Access. So, first one. Uh, and you will get something like this. Uh, so, now what you can do is to copy all the material. The material is here share software uh, mini workshops, a Spark Python. So, execute. 
this command uh, without this. So this command, I will actually copy, I will see if I can copy this, that should be, and paste in the chat. Oh yeah, works. Um, so if you want, you can just uh, copy <coughs> and paste this. The idea is that I will be, I will not be executing this because I already have all my, um, all the notebooks on that folder and, and probably they are updated. I, I just synchronized a few minutes ago, uh, but I will not execute this. So the effect of that is that you will have at the end a folder like this, spark uh, underscore Python. And here I have a set of uh, folders for the notebooks, for the input, for the output. Uh, so kind of organized. Uh, <coughs> And all the materials that we will be using today are there. So that's the first step here. Um, I can leave this and close. So now, now we will create and we will open an interactive job on the cluster uh, for the kind of things, even if a spark was intended for big data, so data that is much, much larger than you can that you can process on a single machine, no matter how powerful your machine is. Uh, the examples that we have are relatively are, are very small, actually, are a few megabytes and that, that not nothing, <coughs> nothing huge. Um, but still we will be using some of the capabilities of a spark with multiple cores. So first. Now is the step is to go here, interactive apps, click here on Jupyter official images. And you will get a formulary form like this, where you can <coughs> select a few, a few fields. Uh, so first, which Jupyter notebook, which kind of Jupyter notebook we would like to use. You can select either this one, which is uh, includes Scala, so another language for, for, for data analysis, Python, R. So they have the whole thing. Uh, if you don't want to, that there is another more restrictive image here uh, just with PySpark. So you can feel comfortable just selecting this one. Um, and that's, that's fine. That will have a Spark. Uh, now local execution for for testing and that's perfectly okay queues on a cluster like ours uh, well we have an initial machine a, a head node machine and behind that machine what is there is a collection of computers you know, relatively powerful computers uh, with 40 cores each a few of them with multiple gpus uh, we will not be using GPUs at this point, even if the latest version of Spark can take advantage of GPUs. <coughs> we will not use that. Uh, and for requesting jobs on the machine, we uh, we need to decide on which queue would like to this job to execute. Uh, one good option here is to select a standby. Uh, with a standby, you have a maximum of four hours for the, of execution. So this is perfectly for what you will be doing today. And I will be requesting the four hours, no big deal. Um, <coughs> you can select pretty much the same options as I am selecting here, standby, four hours of execution. I will request four cores just to demonstrate a little bit in, in, some, of the, uh, in some of the execution. There is one that probably will be a slow with just four cores. Uh, it's just the, one of the machine learning procedures when we will be doing uh, some regressions. Um, but still, four cores is just fine uh, for, for most of the examples here. And I don't want to request 40 because at that moment, you, all of you will start requesting 40 uh, and, and some, most of you will not get the, the job right away. Uh, so, so 40 is a, a good sweet spot for this. And click here, launch. Uh, okay, I already have running some, I will be freeing some of those 
you you can have multiple uh, interactive jobs running. So I will free some resources in case. Uh, Anna will keep just this one. Keep your official images. It will take a few seconds typically <coughs> to get the job. And uh, after a moment, you will get a button here, connect to Jupyter. It will say one core, uh, one node, four cores is running four hours. Uh, and you can click there and get, and you land on something like this. So these are my files on, on, <coughs> on the cluster and go and click on this one that says Spark Python. If you copy the data, you will have a folder like this. Um, and after that, you click in notebooks uh, and you get something like this. I will give you a few minutes just in case uh, some of you need an extra time uh, uh, to land on this. If you don't reach this point, please pose the question you can you can talk. How many, how many people we have today? We have seven people. So yeah, you can you can unmute and and and, and say if you are, if you are getting in trouble with something. Uh, and in the meantime, I will pretty much recapitulate everything that I did. So uh, first thing, I went to this website. Uh, well, forget about all this. We can remove this. This is the website. On demand, TF, HPC, WVU, first one. Uh, you go there, you um, <coughs> enter your, your credentials, you land and something like this. Uh, after that, what we did was open in a shell uh, and execute this, uh, well, this, this command uh, without the sharp and stuff. So it's a command like this. So. <coughs> And this will copy all the materials to your home folder. So you have the notebooks, you can operate with them, you can do uh, explore the, what, what is there. And after that, well, I close this. And I went here to an interactive uh, uh, apps, click here on official images um, and fill the form, click launch. And after that, you land on something like this with a button connect to Jupyter and you are ready to go. And you click connect to Jupyter and you will get an, you know, another tab on, on, on your browser. Uh, and at that moment, you typically land on the, on the home folder. On your home folder, uh, you click on the Spark Python, click on notebooks, and now we can work with it. <clears throat> okay, so in the previous uh, workshops, and pretty much you don't need, if you miss the previous workshop, don't worry. Uh, I, I, will, I will pretty much tell you what, what uh, I mentioned in our previous episodes of this. Uh, I was explaining a little bit about Spark, uh, what it is, why you could, should, could prefer to use Spark. Uh, instead, for example, Pandas for, uh, or uh, Scikit-learn, all those are Python packages. Uh, in the case of Pandas for that analysis, on the, uh, in the case of Scikit-learn for machine learning, uh, they're pretty fine, uh, they, they work, uh, but they were created relatively for a small thing. So, so they can use in most cases, one core. Uh, sometimes they can take advantage of multiple cores, just if they were compiled, or the NumPy library that was uh, that they use was compiled with Open OpenBlast or something that parallelizes the the, the dense linear algebra uh, machinery that most of those algorithms require. So they, they use. Um, <coughs> otherwise, you will be using just one core. Uh, on the, on the contrary, on a Spark, it was created from the foundation uh, to take advantage of multiple cores or even multiple machines. So uh, process the data uh, distributed. It means that when your data grows and grows and grows, you just need to request more and more resources. You don't need a more powerful machine, you just need more machines 
or machines with more cores. Uh, uh, that's one of the advantages of, of using Spark. A Spark can take uh, data in two forms, um, two basic forms. And one is RDDs, and that was the kind of things that we explained in the first and second uh, uh, episodes of this of these mini workshops. Uh, an RDD is just a collection of data uh, without too much structure, just a list of things, um, and that simplicity uh, is good. It, it, it came with some advantages. Also, it came with some limitations. Uh, for the machine learning part, originally all the routines were created on top of RDDs. Starting with version two, I think, of Spark, they moved into all the machine learning stuff written or created on top of data frames. Uh, and that is our starting point for today working about data frames, how we use those, uh, <coughs> all that is inside uh, Spark SQL uh, modules. Uh, so a data frame is basically a table. The table has rows, has columns, the columns have typically have names, uh, and they have types. That is a data frame. It's basically a table, and the machinery to work with those tables is very similar to how you use a relation, relational database, uh, an Excel file, Excel, uh, Excel table, uh, without the constraints, for example, of Excel. In Excel, I think you cannot have a, a, a file, a table with more than one million rows. So that limitation uh, is, is, is no longer the case here on, on Spark. So you can import uh, files that are much, much bigger than that. Um, so that's another thing. So imagine that that analysis of big data is like working with Excel without looking at the file, without having on front of your desktop all those numbers. So start thinking behind the curtains what you can do, what you have to do uh, with the data. It's so big that it's not a longer point to, to look at those numbers. They don't give you much. Uh, so we will start working on that uh, here on uh, number six. Uh, Spark data frames. We will be talking about that, how we create data frames. And we can pretty much forget about RDDs, even if we will use RDDs. And I will demonstrate a little bit how you can, from RDDs, jump into data frames. So click there on uh, number six. Tell me if <coughs> everybody was, uh, was there, is, I hope. Uh, Uh, perfect. Uh, so you open that uh, Jupyter notebook, and we will execute this uh, together. So we will go box by box, trying to understand what is there, what we will be doing. Uh, and this one is just plain exploration on, on what it is. After that, we will do some more real uh, examples uh, with some uh, data that I found. Uh, by the way, this is a good place if you are looking for data. Uh, it's called Kegel. Uh, see this, this website. Uh, I took some of the, of the data sets from there. Um, the good thing about this is that they also have scientific data a little bit. So don't, uh, it's usually not much. Uh, in most cases, the data that you find, examples that you find are things that are appealing for computer scientists, but not for, uh, not for computational scientists. Uh, so they don't talk about real, real science. Uh, and here you can find things like that, a little bit things in astronomy, a little bit things in biology, chemistry. So you can find a more interesting things if you are not much interested about uh, housing prices or stock market or things like that. Uh, <coughs> um, good. Okay. Um, so we are here. Okay, so here, what, what I have is, uh, okay, uh, this one is just to tell a little bit about uh, the machines uh, we are running. 
So I request four calls on machine. I know you are running on a container. Well, this is the name of the, the way we put the code in, in, a, in, in, a, in an isolated entity, so to speak. Uh, and this machine has 40 cores. So you can see here, you can see the compiler. You can see we are using a very recent version of Python or a relatively recent version of Python. And um, that's it, 40 cores, but I request just four cores. So for everything that I'm doing, I'm constrained to use just four cores. <coughs> so let's start with this. As I told you, um, Spark, uh, um, uh, it's a software packages that is, for most part, uh, uh, language independent. So they, they, you can work with the Spark in several languages. The natural language is both Java and Scala. Uh, so you can work directly on that. And most of the functionality opens when you work with the Scala. Um, and it has official uh, APIs for languages such as uh, Python, which is called PySpark, uh, for, uh, um, for R, and there are two lines there. You can use Py Spark R or Sparkler. Those one was implemented directly for the people from Spark. Another one was implemented by people of R Studio, uh, Cloudera, I think. Um, uh, and they give you access to all the functionality through those other languages. Uh, that's one thing. We will be using PySpark. We will be using the Python uh, access, so the Python API uh, for Spark. Um, and again, there are two ways uh, of using Spark. You can use what is called RDDs, uh, resilient distributed data sets, this is a very simplistic, very simple uh, data and managing, uh, uh, management uh, class, or you can use data frames, which is basically working directly with tables. That extra structure of tables <coughs> give us some advantages when, when, when we are working uh, in some cases. There are some things, for which it's better to use RDDs. And the advantage is that if you have, if you are used, working with a data frame, a data frame is also an RDD. So you can go back and get the RDD, manipulate the RDD if you need, and you can go out uh, uh, and explore the other notebooks that I, that I have there uh, when I'm working with RDDs. And, and you will see that there are two things that you can do manipulations, operations with RDDs, and some actions. So those actions will trigger the execution of RDDs, which is mm -hmm. same thing here. Everything that you are doing with the SPAR, uh, for most part, is uh, lazy execution. It means that when you ask for something, it will, in most cases, return immediately. Because only when you request the data associated to that, when you trigger an action, uh, is when the data will start being processing. Uh, so that give uh, Spark the ability to organize the execution better, to uh, orchestrate how the data operations will take place. Uh, so you will see that very clear. It means that in many cases, for example, you try to open or create a, a data frames, we will see that from something that doesn't exist, you don't get the error until you trigger an action. Uh, that, that's something. So let's explore here. I have here a few links if you want to explore that. Um, this is the entrance point to, into Spark. Uh, and you will see the version of PySpark. Is, this is, I think, the latest version uh, on here. So when we were working with RDDs, the, um, our door was called uh, Spark Context, in the Spark Context. In the case of data frames, the entrance door, uh, it's called an Spark session. 
That's what we'll be using here. Um, and a spark session can be created with something like this, something as simple as this, or something more uh, elaborated with the spark session, dot builder, put an, uh, uh, an app name, some configuration flags, and after get or create. So this is pretty much the recipe for, for a Spark uh, session. It will take a little bit, yes. I will actually show you here, if you can Spark, uh, you see here, what I create here was an Spark session where <coughs> we'll try to put all the data in memory. And for the kind of things that we'll do doing here, having that in memory just fine. You can have the data in memory, in files. You can have some um, flexibility on, on how you want to, uh, to store the data. If the data doesn't fit in memory, it will go into a file. Uh, so there are some. And here, I've never specified that. So, I am trying to use as many cores as Spark is able to detect. Uh, and it is smart enough to, to know that I have, I am on a machine with 40 cores, but I only have four cores available. So that, that is a good thing. Um, so otherwise you can decide that your master is local and put in the brackets, the number of cores that you want to use locally or just link into a distributed uh, a Spark instance if you want to, to deal with the data uh, at large. So now, data frame creation. Everything that we will be doing, so this is the idea. First, a Spark session, this is our uh, front door for a Spark, for data frames. So now, what kind of things we would like to learn in this, in this business. First, how to create a data frame. So how to create a table, how I can build a table, um, either manually or from a file or some, some external entity which will, will, will capture the, all the data. That's one thing. Another thing that we would like to do with that data frame is to add new row, new columns to that, uh, create new data frames, uh, or remove or, or make a selection. So that those kind of operations, operations with, with columns. So you, we can create a new column that is a function for another column. All those are the basic things that you expect to have on a data frame. <coughs> and we will explore those. And at the end, um, we would like to store our data that we have manipulated, we were clean, into a file. And there are two well-known, well, known, well uh, highly used, widely used uh, formats. Uh, one is Parquet. Uh, those are formats for storing data uh, by columns. In contrary with SVN, uh, C, uh, CSV files that store the, the data by rows. Uh, one is probably easier or more natural, if you are looking at, uh, at the data as a human, uh, the column storage is more natural uh, if you are working with the data as, from the computer's uh, side, especially for data analysis. Uh, so data frame creation. One, uh, the first way of creating a data frame could be from RDD, from an RDD of rows. Uh, so here I am importing, uh, well, I don't need pandas, in fact, here. So I am importing this by Spark SQL import row. And here I am creating a data frame from a list of rows. So a row is basically like, imagine like a Python dictionary, but uh, slightly different in the, in, in, it's a different object anyway, um, with different um, key value pairs. So I have here one, B, C, D, so a, a bunch of, of, <coughs> of elements that could be even a date. Um, and from that list of rows, I am building a data frame. So this is a way of constructing that. I will have an example where I'm doing this in a more real world case uh, where, where things look 
a little bit more complex. Um, and I build that. Um, you can also build a data frame from a list of sets here. So this, uh, <coughs> and at that moment, as we don't have here, here we have some names, here we don't, but we can separately declare the schema. So those are start adding into the language of this. A data frame is a table. Table has rows um, and columns. Tables have, uh, have also schemas. Um, a schema is basically a declaration of what is the name of the column and which is the type associated to that column. So uh, contrary, for example, for NumPy arrays, so num, you are working with Python, NumPy arrays, uh, and NumPy arrays only have one kind, one type, one data type. Uh, something is uh, the table or the, the, the matrix is real, uh, with real numbers, all the numbers there are uh, floating point numbers or uh, uh, three uh, reals. Here, each row is of one type, but different row, different one column is one type, different columns can have perfectly different type, data types. So in this case, we have one column here, which is an integer, another column, which is a floating point number, a real, a, another column with the strings, another column with dates and timestamps. So that is another way of creating a, a data frame. So this data frame and the first that this data frame here that we create in closer to a spark directly with rows is exact, the end is exactly the same as this one. A, so you see here, the data frame and the schema expressed there is exactly the same. Um, you can also start with pandas and that's probably the React. That's why I have pandas here in the top. So pandas is another package for that analysis. Very good package, but it's in, in, in general, it's for just data that you process a relatively a small uh, scale. Um, so it needs to fit in memory uh, for a data pandas data frame. It doesn't need to be the case uh, with the Spark. With the Spark, you can use on a machine like ours that had 90 gigabytes of RAM, you can perfectly have a data frame, which is one terabyte. So it will not fit, the entire table will not fit in memory. And it's still a Spark is able to work with it. Um, pandas, all, you can only work with pandas if the, the data frame fits in memory. Um, and here I have a pandas data frame here. This is how in pandas you create a data frame. So here I have a pandas data frame called pandas <coughs> underscore df. And I am creating from that with this method, create data frame. I enter in the pandas data frame. I am getting at the other, at the other side a, a spark data frame. Same thing. Um, and this one is like an even more manual way. When I'm building an RTD, remember it is, it, this is something that I discussed in previous, uh, in previous workshop, in the first workshop at, at least. Um, so I am building an RTD with this, uh, Spark context, which is the natural way and, and for RDDs, I have a list of sets here and I am building from then an RDD. From the RDD, I am creating the data frame, but here I don't have the schema. So I am declaring at least the name of the columns directly and Spark is inferring the, the data types by reading the data directly. Uh, from, from checking that all those are integers, all those are floating point numbers. So I, okay, the schema for this column is this, the schema for this column is this. Um, so that is a way of uh, creating our data frames from different uh, explicit 
uh, objects. Now, two new functions here. One is mm, dot show, the method dot show to, to see um, a portion in most cases of the, uh, of the data frame, at least a certain number of rows and how to print the schema. So here, let me see. Um, yeah, so this is the table. So this is the app dot show. This is how I print the schema. So notice that I have several rows, um, several uh, um, different columns, sorry, uh, and the data types associated to that. Uh, there is something else that I can do here, for example. Um, I will show you here, I will use this. Uh, there are ways, for example, to present the data uh, instead of a table and rows um, as a, a vertical line. So here I have the same thing, the records that just presented as rows of data. This is a good way if you want to explore, for example, something that has too many columns uh, and it will not fit nicely here on this format. So you can go and check a, a few elements uh, to see if you are going into the right direction, uh, getting those in a, in a vertical uh, format. Now, this is how we get data frames from explicit uh, objects, from lists or, or, or Panda data frames. Now, another way is from external files. The most common external files that I, you can think uh, in this case are JSON files. They're one natural way of storing data that has some structure, well structured or semi structured way uh, is, a, is, a, is a JSON file. Uh, another one is from CSV files. So I will, I will show this one. Uh, <coughs> So I have here a file. So th this one is not Python. This is, a, I am just executing this uh, with, you um, know, IPython, Jupyter will allow me to execute a shell commands if I put a exclamation mark here. So I'm just looking just for you to see how is the format of a JSON file. It looks like Python dictionaries, like a list of Python dictionaries. Um, it's not exactly like that. There are some, some restrictions on that, um, but they look like, they, they look very, there is some uh, very much uh, Python picture. Um, so that's how this file looks like. Uh, and here, and there is this function Spark. This is the Spark session, read JSON and the location of the file here uh, and show. And this gives me the opportunity to do something here uh, to demonstrate why this is not the same. Imagine, I, I don't have this file, uh, peoples. Uh, but if I execute that, well, oh, in this case, it will, it will try, it will trigger that. Yes, yeah, it's not usually the JSON. Yeah, it would, it's, it's really that. When I build in an RDB uh, directly, it will, in most cases, it will not trigger the error until uh, uh, until you actually. Uh, okay. Um, uh, try to get the data, try to collect it. And what else? Okay, so <coughs> now we have the data or we capture that. I will demonstrate in another, in, in, in a...
you get me? I got some, yeah, okay, okay, so. Yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, I got something, I got disconnected uh, suddenly, so I don't know what happened. Um, so where we were here, uh, I will see if I'm not losing my map. Uh, yeah, I think it's okay. I will re-execute this just in case. Yeah, no, it's okay, I'm going back. Uh, <clears throat> which is another good thing uh, with the, those notebooks. Even you lose the connection, the notebook is still there uh, running. So you can reconnect and, and continue working with it. No problem with that. Um, so this is first, how you see the, um, I show you this, how you get an idea about the rows, if they look correct. Um, so there are several ways of doing this. Uh, so, for example, you can, this is typically from the RDD or, well, also the data frame to check, for example, how many rows we have yeah, there. Jeremy, you need to share your screen. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Wait a minute. I don't know where this is. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, so what I was executing here was looking at one, one, one row, uh, getting, for example, uh, uh, how many elements do we have in my data frame? So again, this is like working with an Excel file uh, without, this is another typical uh, line, especially for RDDs. Uh, to look at is just give me two elements. Give me uh, just uh, the first two elements. You can get the last one. Uh, I think it's tail, um, the last elements. So you get an idea. You don't want to see all that. You're just going to see if in a few, uh, get a sample of them uh, to see if you are going in the right direction. Uh, and now, if you execute this, is this is just for, for, for Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, you execute this, and now you get access to a pretty uh, way of looking at uh, data frames. So they convert internally in the HTML uh, blocks and, and they show those. Uh, so this is a nicety. Um, oh yeah, I mentioned this right here. Uh, so how to see that in a vertical so you can so like, okay, just show me a couple. There are too many columns. So I would like to see those columns rows. It's easier for me to see. Uh, this is another thing, uh, same for pandas. You can do this, get, okay, which are the columns there? Uh, the schema. And now you can get, if you do this without this, in most cases, when you operate with a data frame, what you get with the operations is a new data frame. It doesn't mean that the data is duplicated. It doesn't happen here. So it's just a new object. And when and that object is linked to the first object, when you need data, it's just going in a pipeline, gathering all the data and getting there. So when you execute this, you see that, well, it will explode, explode this because I already put that. Uh, you are getting a new data frame. Uh, and it's this one with the three columns. So instead of the five columns and getting a new data frame, which is perhaps three columns, uh, you can say, okay, please describe that. Uh, and you get that. If you are not using uh, this uh, ripple, um, well, you can still get something like that. So the describe is a new um, a method here that will basically uh, give you a few stats about the, the, the data. How many elements do you have? Mean, standard deviation, mean, max. That's it. If you want to get the whole thing, now this is, the, the, this is one of the dangerous methods. Uh, it's a collect. It will return a list of rows. Uh, and again, if you don't have enough memory for that, it will 
you are sharing your solvent. Um, but for this, it's okay. So you are getting the whole thing, not just a few elements, the whole thing. Again, I put this one, uh, or converting the data frame into pandas. And the same reason we hear the same routine here is taking all those data frames, no matter what, pandas or Spark, and exposing that uh, as, as, as tables, HTML tables. Now, selecting columns. One column, there are two ways of selecting columns. This one is the, uh, let's say, uh, you know, simple way, uh, not so often used because if you have, for example, columns with the spaces, it will not work that way. If you uh, have columns with names that are also functions uh, in, in the data frame, you will be, uh, you will be covering the namespace. So uh, it's, it's kind of problematic, but this is one way of doing it. Um, column, the, the data frame dot, the name of the column, uh, or a more explicit way, getting the column. When you are doing this, you are not getting the data. It's just another object that prepare you to gather the data, but not real processing. It's lazy processing all the way here. And so a column here, and what I'm doing here is checking if the column C, well, it's the same as the <coughs> upper version of column C, all those are the columns, so the answer is yes. Okay, um, here I am selecting two columns and exposing those two columns, same thing, same here, okay. Basic operations with data frames. As I mentioned, new columns you can get with that. You can extract rows that from a column that fulfill a, a special, um, filter, this is similar to the filter for RDDs that we already mentioned in a previous uh, workshop, or a grouping. And this is something that, yeah, we will be using this. Uh, or ordering, if you want, for example, the RDD to gather some ordering uh, with one column, this is another. So those four uh, methods are widely used, uh, not very simple methods. And so there are methods associated for the um, for the data frames and also functions that you can apply to columns in order that those are all described in the uh, API. There are many, many, many more. Uh, I'm just selecting those that we use all the time. Uh, so new columns, you get a new column, for example, here, I am getting the column C that is this column here. I am applying a function. Which function? The function for the strings, upper, which basically put all the columns in uppercase. Uh, I have another example where I'm doing a little more, more math thing where I'm building a, um, columns from mathematical functions, maybe more interesting. Um, same thing. So here I am using this dangerous, uh, way of declaring columns, uh, checking all the columns, or getting all the rows uh, that fit uh, that for the column num element number, uh, column number A, uh, A number, column A uh, is equal to one. So just another way of getting one particular column, or for example, the columns, which A is bigger than one. Um, here, I am getting a grouping. If you don't do this to this point, you get a group data, an SQL group. Um, what you can do that, but what I'm doing here is taking all the rows that for which the value of A is the same and they will be created as a group. And after you can get a statistics from them, for example, all of them that are the same. They, they, for example, you have a, a row with this, this, this species of this. And may, there are many with other species. And after that, you would like to do, for example, and now there is another column 
that contains the, the height of the, of the tree, for example. And you would like to get the, uh, the average size for every single species. So that you first group by species, and after that, you get uh, a, 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 an average. Uh, what I'm doing here is just like, getting account. Uh, if you don't have the ripple there, well, you can express that directly on the ASCII, ASCII table. So there is just one element with one, one element with two, one element with three. Okay, now those are APIs, so the functions methods for the data frame class, a few of them. Um, yeah. Uh, I think here, let me see, I can show you here, um, one of the data frames, uh, here, uh, no, 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 here. The API for Python. If you want to explore this, uh, so let's see if I can get it quickly. Where is the API reference for data frames? Uh, data frame, data frame. Yeah, yeah. So I just show you a little bit of all the many, many routines that you can execute. I show you the grouping, the uh, well, group by here, the filter is around here. So there are many more, many more uh, ways for discarding elements that are null, all that. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing are functions, functions that you can apply to uh, a column and they're here. I will show you just a few of them. Uh, so here, what I'm doing, uh, okay, this one. I am building step-by-step step an entire data frame from an NumPy array. So first I import NumPy, of course, I create a, an array, and now I am getting a Spark context where I'm parallelizing this data, this NumPy array, and I get in a couple of elements. So this is just one um, element here. And, and here, oh, let me see, kind of the, uh, well, I'm building here the data frame in pandas first. And after that, from the pandas data frame, I'm getting a, a, a spark data frame. So this is, this is my first column. <coughs> Numbers from zero to, to pi. Now, we'll start <coughs> working with this. Uh, final element, of course, to buy. Uh, here, uh, yeah, the reference for all the functions. And I will be working with this uh, to get an identity from uh, trigonometric identity. Here. So I'm importing absolute values, cosine or sine as well, all basic functions. All those are here in functions. I think if I click here, you will get all the functions that you can play. And again, a long list of functions. Uh, and I'm building here, step by step, like an cascade, um, a new column here. So a new data frame with a new column with the cosinus of X. From that, I am getting a new column where I am taking the column for the column that I created before, multiplying by itself to get the cosine of the square. And then I add in another column here. So every single time I'm building a new data frame um, with the sinus, with the sinus square. And after that, I am getting here the, the cosinus square plus the sinus square. So you expect one from them and that's exactly what is happening here. So all of this are here, one. So I'm building a data frame here that I call DF4. Um, I'm exposing the, and all of them are building the columns, um, stacking. And I will request this. It will say, okay, I need 20 columns. I, I need to explore 20 rows here. So it will go and gather all the chain of data in the, for getting the 21st rows and, and get just those. It will not go into the entire, uh, uh, building the entire table, it's just getting what you ask. Um, and here, just an exploration, of course, due to numerical uh, uh, manipulations, how you store numbers 
uh, for cosinus sinus, how those, those things are, you will not get exactly one. So I'm getting, for example, how, which are the numbers that I'm getting, which how many are exactly one, uh, and other options here. So yeah, I probably forgot to group by entity. Oh, I forgot to execute this. Um, yeah. So now I got well, most of them are actually one uh, point zero. There are a few others that are slightly different, but um, this is just numerics. Uh, what is taking place there? So this is how you build new data frames, adding columns, operating with those columns. Uh, thanks to the many, many functions that you see here in the AP, API reference for the data frames. Now, applying a function. Uh, so again, you can apply functions from uh, pandas. Uh, let me see, let me get this. So I am creating a function in pandas, silly function here. Um, and I'm building, I'm using that functions to select a new column uh, that you can put. If you don't put that, the name of the column is the name of the function you're calling. You can put an alias to that. Uh, and I think that's what I did here. Uh, no. uh, yeah, I put an alias here. So I put the name of the column. Please call the name of this column this way. Uh, so I'm not doing that operation here. So we'll get just the name of the function. So I'm getting there a new data frame um, same team same thing here i am building new data frames where i'm operating with that um, with a mapping and now with the grouping so uh, here well this is a silly example uh here i have a few values here but there are two that are have the same value here for uh for the color so this is the schema the schema the first element is color and i have what well, values in some um i am grouping by color and i'm getting the average uh, and show this is the same thing for example if you have three species you group by the species and after um, you operate with them uh, here i'm grouping by color I am getting a new function, wrote a function that will take the data, um, apply the function and explore that. So, uh, yeah, what else? A few more examples with uh, the frames, groupings, well, not much. Uh, now, storing the data. Three typical way of storing data. Well, of course, there are more. You can store that with types or uh, uh, relational databases, other things. But for storing this in files, uh, there are three major ways. So, uh, for if you include JSON, you can also store this in JSON files. So CSV files is one way of storing the data from the human side. Uh, not very good idea if the data is really huge. Um, first, because you are storing the data as text files and, and storing the data in text files is expensive. It's a bad idea. Uh, if the data grows, it's much better to store data in a binary format. You can store that with HDF5, net, net CDF. There are very good libraries there for storing binary data. And also there is this ways of storing data in column, column format. Uh, columnar format, uh, which are parquet and ORC. So, but if you still insist in the storing the data in CSV files, this is how you do it. Uh, I'm just checking that uh, the data was not there, I'm deleting, um, and I'm writing the CSV file there, and after that, I re rereading the data. Uh, so that is, parquet is one, uh, parquet or parquet, I don't know, um, is, one method uh, is one file format. Uh, here, I think it's if you want to see uh, how is the format is well established in the uh, data analysis community. One way storing the data um, comes from Apache, uh, and this is how you use it. 
uh, and same thing here. This is how you use it uh, with other C. So um, both ways uh, are, are working. This is more Hadoop side, the other is more uh, uh, modern if you want to. Working with SQL. Well, not got too much because I would like to really do something in machine learning. Um, one of the good things of this is that all that we use was creating data frames and all that, but you can also use, if you know SQL, uh, and this is a very typical line for SQL practitioners. So how you gather data from SQL, uh, the, the way you process that data is first create a temporal view uh, of the data that will create the data frame and view as a table as a as a table for for SQL, and after you can execute um, uh, selections, uh, filterings in the SQL way. This is one way of doing that, or create a, a, a function that you can apply inside the. Uh, <coughs> what what I mean? What I did here? Uh, what I did here? Yeah, I forgot to do some um, for SQL. Um, and that's it. Okay, all that. I have now one another example here that is still working. I, I, I didn't reach the point to get into the machine learning, but I will show you a little bit the two ways of building data frames from real scientific data. Well, or a little bit. Of relatively simple with some nuances here. Um, so here, I am taking a file from a CSV file. Uh, the higher the file will see uh, it's more categorical, not so much numerical, um, but it's still, uh, it will, it's going into the, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to execute this. So here, execute this to get watermark and here, same thing, uh, spark context, spark session here. So two ways. First, I do the challenge of building the data frame completely manual. Forget about the CSV file. It's a CSV file, or that there are routines for that. How I will do it from scratch, reading the file directly. Good thing is that, okay, the file, I will take the, the extra challenge is the file is compressed and I will go uh, and open the file as a zip file, uh, not explicitly open the file, uh, uh, something, okay, I, I can do, but I will not do it here. Uh, and uh, reading the file, reading the content of the zip file, the zip file contains several multiple, uh, multiple files. I will just pick in one, uh, the only file that is there actually, uh, and read. The problem with that is that the CSV file is separated by commas, but also you can have uh, strings which has quotes and commas inside and it will destroy you uh, if you read this in a naive way. Uh, so for jumping into that, I have to um, get a regular expression that will capture commas that are not inside uh, quotes, all that. So an extra uh, challenge here, uh, this is still possible. I am reading the data, C file, reading the data, getting uh, that. Uh, notice the first line is the schema or at least the name of the columns. And so I'm will excluding that. The last line is just an empty line. I need to exclude that line. So I'm getting just starting from the second line, line number one, until the, um, the line before the last one. Um, so I get this number of, of lines, uh, I can get a few of them. So now I am building, I am creating a function, it's a mapper uh, that will take every single line here and gather in the data. I know the schema, I know how the light, so I know that this one is yes or no, I will convert it into a boolean 
And this one is a real number. This one is a ball. And so I am getting those. There are a few things that are a little bit more complex here. So the, the, uh, this one is still not present. I will just take those as a strings um, because they are the data ranges. Ideally, what you can do is to convert those to two columns, for example, with the mean or maximum range and age range, for example. Uh, uh, here, <coughs> I have something that is categorical, the good, the health, overall health, I think is bad health, good health, very good health, well, excellent health, I don't know. Uh, so all the values, I just keep them right now as strings. Um, so I did some cleaning, but not all the way. Oh, uh, so here I'm gathering those. I'm trying to exclude uh, the rows, or getting all those that fit the uh, the schema. I'm building rows. So at the end, when I'm executing this mapper here, well, well this was more for exploration. Uh, uh, I will take the data, all the rows, building an RDD. So this is what I'm doing here. So this is an RDD. It's just a list of lines, of text lines, or so strings, N nothing big here. Uh, and now I am building another RDD where I'm mapping uh, every line. I go into, it, I will be injected into the mapper, getting the extraction of the data. Remember that I have four cores. So four cores will be working in parallel for this. And, and uh, well, it happens so fast, but uh, it's doing that. This is taking that uh, on the data and building a data frame from there. And I'm putting here, this is another function that is declared here for catching I think it's around here. If you want to put the data preferentially in memory, which is anyway what is happening, but uh, another way, just to mention that there is something here. Same thing is, yeah, I don't know. Put in the cache. Um, and how many elements I have here? So now it's processing the vectors. I'm getting the schema there uh, with boleans. This is one way going directly from reading the file, getting the text file, splitting by the new lines, getting those lines, inject those lines into a mapper that will split those using the regular expression, building an RDD, and from the RDD plus an schema, building a data frame. Another way of doing this <coughs> that will go in a slightly different direction, uh, well, I get this for on this notebook for getting uh, the data frame exposed here to false BMI. So a bunch of indicators uh, of um, her disease uh, that could be true or false. Uh, and, and I will get notice that some of them are categorical for machine learning. At some point, I will need to convert those into numbers. Uh, here, age, it will need to convert into age ranges or something. Uh, so there is still work to do here. Uh, female, male, uh, in this case, we will convert a binary thing to uh, zeros and ones. So there are more things that needs to be done here uh, uh, later. But here, what I'm doing is getting directly uh, with the schema infer directly. So this infer the schema, take the header uh, and build from the CSV file. It works, one line, perfect. Uh, but after that, uh, if you see the schema is slightly different, all those yes, no will be strings. Um, yeah, for most part, all those will be a string. So there are things that at the end will need to go and create or, or replacing some columns. Uh, with that. Uh, I describe in here the data. Let me see. Takes a while. Uh, how many lines? I think it's 400, uh, almost 400 lines. Yeah, it's almost yeah, 300. 
uh, has been cleaning one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Count. This is the number of, of elements. So they have averages, uh, BMI, mean max. Or, there are probably data that is uh, fishy that needs to be cleaned. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's okay. This is you can work with. Uh, as the data is not that big, another thing that I can do is to plot a little bit the data. So uh, you cannot plot directly either pandas or seaboard. Pandas, uh, matplotlib, matplotlib is a traditional library for 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 printing for plotting. Seaboard uh, is more for data analysis for statistics. Uh, so it's a little bit more specialized. It's using matplotlib behind. Um, and I will use that for another another notebook. Here is just uh, taking the data frame, sparse data frame, converting that into a pandas data frame, knowing that I can still put that in memory. And at the end, I'm getting a few uh, an idea, for example, of, of, of what I get by sex, um, female, male, uh, the prevalence of heart disease. So this uh, darker area uh, 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 are the lines, so the rows, the people associated um, that have the presence heart disease, uh, more probably male, uh, many negatives, so all, all that. And after that, uh, there are opportunities for to start exploring. The idea here is uh, something that I started this uh, today trying to show a little bit uh, this, is going to a predictor or classifier knowing, okay, if someone fits those, 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 those categories, which is the probability of this person to develop heart disease. That, that's, that's one thing. Uh, I have another one. I think this one is also data processing. I will, I will, uh, I did this yesterday. Uh, still not into the machine learning. I will go relatively quickly on this one. Probably will not execute it. I led you to execute this one. Um, so this one is, is, is I'm taking a data. Again, I took this data. I found this data here on Kaggle. Um, uh, this one here uh, is from the uh, Amazon forest uh, um, from a range of uh, Dates uh, from 2000, I don't remember exactly, 2003, I think. But um, spots fires uh, on the Amazon uh, captured by satellites. So, so here, okay, same sparse session. So, natural thing, sparse session. This is the sparse session. This is where I took the data uh, and the original inspiration for this. Uh, I think. Originally was created for pandas. I converted to the Spark. Uh, so these are the columns on the data. Uh, this is a view, a little bit of the CSV file. Uh, I am just guarding the CSV file, drawing the schema, getting the header. Uh, those are the values that I got from the schema, counting the values, getting again too many many columns to, to, to see that in, you know, with columns. So I am getting a couple of, va of values, the first two values here to see how they look like. Um, and um, getting the columns, for example, and from the area of the cell. So basically it's a satellite looking into the uh, Amazon forest, getting some images and getting some reticula or some, some uh, Patches uh, and they have those patches have some area, and in that area, there is a fraction that is burning. So, I would like to see instead of having the cell and the area and the fraction, I will combine those two columns into another column that is more interesting for processing, which is how much is the burn area. So, it's something that has more uh, an area associated with it. Uh, so, I am taking the column. So that's why I import this function column. Uh, I am multiplying two columns and building another column here, burn area. Uh, you see here the value that I'm getting uh, for a couple of, of elements. Um, now I can start, it's not mandatory, but uh, if you want, you can 
start removing or building new data frames where I am hiding. It's like when you, in Excel, you hide a, a column in Excel uh, because you don't want to clutter your, your view of, of, of the file. It's a little bit like that. Uh, I am taking the list of columns. From that list, I am removing the columns that I would like to remove. I am getting a selection, uh, a new data frame with just the columns that I that I want. So I remove a few of them, uh, print the schema. So same thing. Uh, now I would like another thing: columns. There are usually uh, in real world data columns that are have invalid numbers, ages, age negative. Doesn't make sense, but sometimes you get things like that. Um, or simply, if you are taking data from um, instruments, you can get invalid data. Something happened at that moment, and, and, and you need to clear the data. So there are functions for that, and this is one uh, that you can use. If there is a NAND, not a number, or there is a null value there, I am getting, for example, how many values I have there. I am counting how many uh, uh, can be dropped because they are invalid. So there is one value there. I am removing that value. And now I have data without those uh, rows with invalid data. And that's OK because it's just one. It's just one value. They can remove this. It will not affect. Uh, too much. Yeah, in some cases, that could create biases. Uh, that's another problem. Uh, so basically, I'm taking that and dropping uh, dropping values. Uh, another thing that could happen is that I have duplicate uh, data. Uh, this is not the case here, but I check uh, if I can remove call rows that are equivalent. Uh, the number is the same. I don't care. Uh, now. I can start making a correlation analysis. Now I get the data. I have all the data frame. I will start getting here. Uh, if some values, for example, uh, make sense that they're all the same, I was thinking that it could be all the same, but they are not. They, they, they have some variety. So I will keep those values uh, as they are. Uh, there are two variables here that correlate perfectly. So there is not much point to keep both. Uh, so carbon emission, fire emissions, uh, you can keep one of them, remove the other. Um, and now I am using Seaboard. It's another library in Python for, for, for plotting, uh, specialized in data analysis. Uh, I am making the correlation. I am making plots for a visual correlation uh, uh, from a sample. So I'm getting a sample of the data, 10,000 elements. I am plotting that. And immediately, it gets to my attention that C and TM are perfectly correlated. So I can remove one of them um, and get things uh, shorter. Uh, another way of doing this is getting real numbers and decide that which values do you want to remove because they are perfectly correlated. Or you can go into a more sophisticated thing like a PCA where you are uh, reducing dimensionality, uh, which is a completely different thing here. But uh, well, I'm just removing one column. I don't want to take care of that. Uh, that's what I'm doing here. Uh, um, the correlation, this is uh, now numerical correlation there that I can also express here with a mapping. Uh, or, uh, color map, um, the heat map, sorry. Um, and now, I know what I'm doing here in the final portion is building a new data set where I will get the columns that I want, excluding those that are not interested, um, and doing some beautification. And if you see before, uh, the year and the month were doubles. Uh, real, uh, floating point numbers. I'd say, well, I don't want to get them as, as that. I would be happy with them as integer. So I can convert those an integer. This is perfectly fine. It could be a good idea or not. It depends on what you want to do later with them. Sometimes having a real number is what you want. Uh, sometimes what you want is to go and not store them as 
double precision, but single precision in case that you want to inject those later on on a neural network, it could work better if you go into single precision. It depends what you want to do after that. Uh, just for the sake of example, I am casting the values here as integers, integers for the year, month. Uh, for some other values, I am changing for and putting just three digits um, decimals. I am building a table. Uh, let me see. Oh, let me see if I get. Yeah. Uh, only did it. Uh, I have to if I go here. Or you need to extend it. Uh, yeah, no. Well, it's still, you can ex enlarge this a little bit and will look nice, let's say, like nice, nice ASCII table with all those values. And the last thing that I did um, is okay, I clean all that. I would like to store my data frame for processing later. Uh, and I will store it. I will choose parquet as file format, um, and I will store that. Uh, uh, when I did this, I was using four cores, uh, so you will notice that the parquet file will be uh, is actually a folder with four files there with all the data. So you can recreate the data frame, continue working with it, <coughs> and that's this is this example. After that, you can work. Um, it depends on what you want to do with that. Now, um, well, let me see if I go this one. I can go with this one. Not super interesting. This one was something that I just captured is like a canonical example uh, for computer scientists. Not much of my appealing, but, um, but it was simple. So that's why I chose it. Um, this one is for predicting the house pricing. I have another one that is much, much interesting, more, more scientific. Uh, so I will go this one quickly. Uh, the idea is that you probably would like to see this one. This one is for linear regression. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is a, a, a simple example. And uh, there is another one with uh, more interesting data. With the, there, there are more, uh, uh, processing uh, uh, happening. So this one, uh, this is an old data set. Uh, they mentioned here 97. They have locations, pricing, the housing, uh, and some values as well, some uh, values so associated to the entries, rooms, bedrooms, all that. They are trying to predict the price of the house. Well, so that's what they are doing. So the typical thing is, again, by Spark, get the Spark session. Uh, I will be doing some linear regression here. So I will be importing some of this Spark ML uh, functionality. Uh, so this one will not go, and probably in, in another workshop, it will, I will go in the other way around. So assuming that you know now all the data frames and going into the, numerics or the math that is behind a linear regression, a support inverter machine, all that. Um, so there are two routes here and I will I'm be following the data frame into uh, looking into the machine learning, like a needle uh, overview of that. Um, so and all that is here on ML. Uh, there is this other library ML lib it's the old one. <coughs> you typically don't want to mix those. But, uh, um, it's not it's the case here. Um, what is happening here? So here I got the Spark session here, loading the data. Um, you see the rows here from those rows. Uh, I think here I am building. Yeah, I have here DF. What I did this here. Uh, oh yeah, here I am reading the data as a CSV file, um, getting the schema that I already prepared. So I'm not trusting the the automatic the inferred schema. 
uh, got in the schema here. And this one is an Spark um, data frame. Now, all that, the same thing, print the schema, getting the idea, uh, getting new columns here, pop the rooms. I getting the average age of the people you know, on that location. Uh, and with that, what I did was taking uh, the data frame, which is a Spark data frame, knowing that this is still a small, this is a pretty small uh, um, data frame, getting to pandas and from pandas coding and, uh, and using the plotting interface uh, inside pandas, which goes into a, a matplotlib, plotting the bars, so the age, and you see there are some values here that doesn't make sense, that the people there, their average is four years old, doesn't make sense. Oh, the data could have some issues here. And of course, the people older. But this other side here, uh, under 10 years old, well, uh, doesn't seem right, but anyway. Um, so housing. So here I'm rounding the data uh, for digits. Um, so another data set here from simplifying the data a little bit. Uh, and here, another column where I am taking this value here, uh, the median house value dividing by uh, number. So I am building a new column. Uh, as the name of the column is the same, I will be basically overriding. So I am the new data, the new data frame knows that the value of this column is not the value of the previous one, it's like a transformation of, of it, uh, which is this one. So it's basically a scaling uh, uh, the value of the house. And the columns there, the data frame, uh, and now. In many cases in, uh, in, machine, in, in machine learning, what you want, what you have, especially in, in, in those, there are several kinds of machine learning, but then there is one where you have some known labels, known features, so variables that you gather. Those variables, uh, we assume that knowing those values could predict another one for which we know the, the, the value. Um, we can, we will uh, take the data, separate the data, at least in two sets, uh, testing uh, uh, and training data, testing data, uh, or more often in three sets, the testing data, a validation data, uh, uh, training data, validation data, uh, uh, and, and test data. Uh, the purpose of those three, well, uh, uh, the, the training data is the data that you will use to build the model. Uh, the validation data is the, the data that you will use to fit a bunch of parameters that are not part of the model. Is some, some things that levers that you tune to get more performance on, on, on the model. Uh, <coughs> and the test data is a data that is hidden you never use it until the very end. Uh, you pick that data yeah, just to test in it. You're really, really, really nervous. So unseen data uh, to see if your algorithm is able to, to gather something from the data. Or it's just overfitting. It's just, uh, it's just taking all the data with all these parameters and, and predicting all that it knows. Um, so that is what is happening here. I am getting the data. Well, first, what I'm doing here is taking the different columns and building an assembly, a vector uh, of features. Um, and those are, okay, this is the, I'm producing a column, another column with those features. So this is a guide. This is a typical procedure here uh, on machine learning. Um, so I have here the features here. So a bunch of numbers here that I think they will help me to predict uh, the, the value, in this case, the value of the house. Um, 
So here, let me see. Um, well, here I am taking those features and I don't want, I, I want it to be normalized. I want it to be more into a range so sometimes uh, some values go to high, some of those values and go negative to positive. So you would like to balance those. So another typical procedure is to build those, rescaling all those values. And this one, a standard scaler is, is doing that. Uh, so you go, like in a pipeline, and this is exactly what we will be doing after that, is going in a star, processing the data, one, one by one, <coughs> and get it. After you get that, you put this uh, feed, the standard scaler, uh, uh, standard scaler. oh yeah, yeah, it's taking that, fillers, uh, so now you see the values, I think, of your scale here. So now this value that originally was 129 got the scale into a real number, the value that is from zero to one, I think, um, for all of them. So I think, yes, uh, I'm sure it's if it's zero to one. Uh, okay. Uh, now, now, this is the thing. I'm taking the data. In this case, I'm not dealing with the hyperparameters. So I'm just getting two sets. The training data, the test data. It, you can split that as you want. It could be 75%, 25%, 80%, 20%. And the idea is that the test data is hidden. You no one not use it. Don't start mixing that with the, with the training data. It's something that you reserve for the very end. Um, take the, the, the training data will be 80% of the data. So 80% here, 80% of the data uh, will be for training and I reserving uh, 20%. Another good thing of this is that I'm not taking the first 80% of the data and taking training and, uh, and the final 20%. It could be that the file was organized by price. So it will be taking all the cheap houses first and the more very, very expensive houses at the very end, yeah, and it will not, it will not work. It will not be able to predict because you have something that uh, escape. Uh, the, the. So you will be asking the model to extrapolate when, when you want like to do is to interpolate, uh, basically. So this random split uh, uh, is taking the data randomly and building 80% of the data into train data, 20% uh, into, into test data. And so the train data will have, okay, the columns, it's so it's a schema. Uh, now, what we will be doing is a linear regression. Uh, a linear regression, I will not in this, uh, this path for the workshop, I will not go into the math, but the basic idea is uh, you have data here in one side that goes into this category and another data in this side that goes into another category. And I will be building a function that is like a sigmoid that will separate the data into two halves. In the one dimension version of this is a sigmoid. It looks like this. Uh, and the values will go and, sell and pick and select from this side of the world. It will be this one. From this side of the world, it go into this other category. In multiple dimensions, it will be pretty much the same, but now you have more dimensions, you have more lines, more intercepts where the data will be split. Uh, so you get more values that will separate those uh, with more C-moids, let's say. Uh, <coughs> and this is what is happening here. Uh, so linear regression, uh, it will take the data, uh, the train data, and you will build the model, the linear model here. This is uh, from that model. So now you have a machine, a black box, uh, that is the linear regression box. And so that machine, if you inject new values as features, reconvert them, renormalize, do all that you need to do with them. You inject those, it will tell you if it will fit to the first category or the second category. 
it will go into uh, uh, into those. Um, and now, what will we do in that? Okay, so here in this case, I'm getting the intercept. I will get in uh, the vectors there. Uh, I am getting the predictions. So uh, now I will start checking. Is going down? Oh, I'm, it freeze, uh, yeah, it freeze for a second, yeah. Uh, uh, Sarah, uh, how far, uh, Daniel, uh, how far, I want to go, how much time have you lost from me, uh, Daniel? Let's say a few minutes, a few seconds. Uh, um, I don't know, what was it, like 30 seconds, how was that? 30 seconds, okay. So let's see here. So uh, let me see, go here. Okay, so let's start here. Um, so. I was massaging the data. I was building the features, taking now at the end uh, the linear regression and feeding the data. So we will take those and build in the model, the linear model here. So this is again, let's think about it like a black box. It's something that you inject features, you inject an array of numbers, and you will predict if yes, no. Uh, this is. Mm, uh, uh, this is a valid or this is an invalid, this is a good or bad element um, at, at that point. And now we take the test data and we will do the, the same thing. We will take the data, build the features from the test data, and rescaling, renormalizing those, injecting to that to see what we get. And in some cases, we will predict what we expect. In some other cases, we will not. And we will separate that in four categories. And we will see that. It's really important. So, uh, we'll see. Um, so that is okay, the data frame. Uh, and here, I'm taking, taking the test data, um, transforming that, uh, and getting the labels here. So all the values. Uh, in this case, it's not a category. It's, it's, it's predicting the value of the house. It's a real number. It's doing like that. Um, now, there are a few values here from the statistics point of view that you can uh, uh, that you can get. So, how far the values are? This is one thing uh, of getting. So, how? But is my prediction compared with the known value of that element of the test data? That's one thing. In the case of categories, uh, you basically distribute that in four groups: the true positives, so the values that were uh, predicted go into one category and they work exactly from that category. Uh, the true positives, the true negatives, uh, the false positives, and the false negatives. And from them, and I will probably will mention that in the next one, in the confusion matrix that goes into the, uh, another. I don't think that will go well. For these values here that are um, real numbers, so it makes more sense to compute the, the regression evaluation. That's what. So this one is a canonical example for price housing. Uh, it goes simple uh, in, into the elements. Yeah. And I have here a more interesting, I think, is this one. I will skip the differences. I will go from this one. I think that. Okay. <coughs> Again, I don't think that I will execute. This one is, is, is complex, and I have just four core. So for a, at some point, uh, it will take several minutes if I execute this one uh, for real. Uh, but you can do it. Uh, I will tell you which is the part that takes most of the time. Um, so this one is the data here. So same thing, uh, the very initial part here. I will take in the ML. So this, the, the bias part ML is the data frame based machine learning module for this part. So the modern API. The older API is the MLE. Uh, so that's why I'm going to do this one. 
uh, spark session, spark session here. I'm building the spark session, uh, getting the data. Um, oh, well, is this one? Let me see. Ah, it's not. Let me see. Is this one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for this. So uh, I will do in a linear regression here. So for the about the specific um, it's a logistic regression. So I'm importing all that. Um, building the sparse agent. Getting the data. Flies. And this one is another canonical example. It's uh, on flight, uh, location of airports, origin, destination. And it's trying to predict if, based on a set of values, if this flight is expected to go uh, on time or not. Uh, so, number of values is 2 million. Million seven hundred. And so we we'll start growing the, the number of values here. They have date of the month, date of the week, uh, the carrier, uh, the airport, the original, the origin, destination, if a right on time or not, all that. So, first part is the same. I'm getting all the data, building uh, the CSV file, from the CSV file, building the Spark data set. And now I'm splitting. So here I'm splitting a game as I did in the other one. 80% goes into um, train, 20% uh, into uh, test data. Mm, uh, another thing that I'm doing here is taking the label, which is if it's on time or not, and storing that in a different uh, column for comparison later. So that's um, so. So this is the number of elements that I separate for testing. This is the number of elements, number of rows that I separate for, uh, for training and for testing. And so this is how it looks like. Notice again that I'm not taking the first 80%. If, uh, I'm doing a random split here. Uh, so now a pipeline. So a pipeline is like a chain of data operations that I am doing. Building the as I as I did in the simple example before, uh, building the features, normalizing, uh, and sometimes building an index for for those elements, uh, rescaling some of the values. So here is a little bit more advanced. Um, I, I am doing a cascade of, of, of operations. Uh, so I some of those I'm taking a string, for example, and building an index, a number, associating a number to a string in such a way that I can use that later. So instead of manipulating the string, the, the name of the carrier uh, will not fit so easily in, into those. So this is just ways of converting data. Uh, this vector assembler is taking a set of columns, which is uh, all these columns, and building a uh, some features from that. Taking all those and building an indices from, from those categorical features. Um, so the, the, differ, the difficulty here is that the data is mostly categorical. Uh, so it goes into building indices for, for here and there. It will be much simpler, for example, if the data are just real numbers or you are doing some signal processing so you can take the line of the signal on different bands and, and, and storing all those. It will be real numbers. It will go naturally go in as the features for, for that. Um, now, I built a pipeline model so that all those operations will cascade one on another. Uh, so here it will build a cascade here, this string IDX, they, they, will, they will go in a specific order to build the pipeline. The pipeline now can go 
and feed some training data. Notice that, that the last part here of this cascade of operations that go into this is the logistic regression. This is the actual model, but for building the model, the data has been manipulated, has been massaged and you know, received some, uh, some treatment beforehand until it arrives to the logistic uh, regression uh, function method. Uh, now, I have the data here, and now I will be transforming data. So I will take the, the, the test data, go and inject all that data again into the, the entire pipeline, even into the linear regression to get the prediction. Uh, and the prediction we will say zero here, zero here. And it will be, and this is the challenge of this. This is exactly what we will go into uh, the confusion matrix here. You will see most of the values are zero. It means that if you are like in Morgantown, Morgantown doesn't rain that much, especially in some uh, time of the year. Uh, so you can say, okay, my prediction is no rain today. And I will be right 90% of the time. It doesn't mean that I am a good predictor of, 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 of the probability of raining here. Uh, or in the Amazon, it will be the opposite. I will be predicting in, in, in cities in, in, inside the forest, it will rain every day. And no matter what, it will rain every day. <coughs> so my predictor could be always raining. And doesn't mean that I'm learning anything. Uh, how you put that in numbers? So, well, there are uh, two ways. Uh, so here, I'm have, are you working with categorical data? So zero is means uh, on time, I think. One, it was with delay. Um, so delay is a rare event. Uh, so I would like to capture that. Um, so how we do that? We start exploring that with a confusion matrix. The confusion matrix is a way of putting in four numbers first, uh, how is your prediction? Uh, how many times you predict? Uh, true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. And how I did this uh, here in this, uh, so I took the, the filter, the prediction, and I am checking if I predict one and the label associated to this was one. So this one was a match. And the false positive, I predict one, I predict that it will uh, arrive, I think, late. Uh, and it was not the case, it will arrive on time. Uh, so this is the false positive. Um, true negative, I predict they will arrive late. And I, uh, I think, no, uh, true ne no, negative. Uh, I predict that I will arrive on time, uh, which is, I think, yeah, most of the cases is on time. Um, and actually, it, uh, it, it was uh, it, it was on time. So I predict on time, I got on time. And the false negatives, I predict on time, and I was actually late. So you get that. From those uh, four values, you can get two values that are very representative, especially when there is an imbalance between the truths and false, the, 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 the two categories. One is the prediction, another one is the recall. Notice that if I have here is the true positive, so in the numerator. But if I have too many false positives, it will go and decrease the, the, the prediction. Uh, on the contrary, from the recall, if I have too many false negatives, it will decrease the prediction, the, the recall. Sometimes your model uh, could be better detecting or, or could be, uh, you can be satisfied if you get more better prediction compared with the recalls. For example, uh, picturing someone with COVID and you get some permit. It's better to capture someone and say, you have COVID, don't, you cannot go today or something. Uh, uh, and it was actually not having COVID. It will be less problematic that having passing someone as not COVID, but if we actually had COVID. Um, so that's the difference. That, that's why sometimes you, you will be happier uh, with better prediction 
and some other times you will be go better into a better recall. Uh, what I'm doing here is okay, getting all those four values. So I got those four values here, uh, and I'm computing um, the prediction on the recall. And from the recall, the prediction on the recall, there is another number that is like a balance of those um, that is called the F1. So let's see, uh, true positives. Uh, yeah, okay, many uh, here. And this one, remember, this one was from, I think, was from which data in check here? Uh, predicted, predicted was from the test date. Uh, yeah. So remember, there was 2.7 million, and it was uh, like, uh, well, uh, yeah, you see. It's like 400 uh, million trade. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the data will go into true negatives. It means on time. Uh, uh, and there is this number here, true positives. So that was predicted, it will arrive late. There are here, uh, there is here a very small value here compared with this one. Um, but this one is the problematic thing. Uh, you got this value here. Uh, but this one is small, but it's, it's quite big if you compare with, uh, so how many times you predict false and it was, it, uh, uh, it was not actually the case. <coughs> it was actually late. Um, uh, so now from this one, you get a very good prediction, 99%. Uh, but a really bad recall. So now the idea is to, I would like to better balance between those two things. Uh, what I will be doing is having a value that will be exploring different uh, combinations, different parameters that I have in the linear regression. So uh, the number of iterations, uh, um, I think there is, okay. Uh, this is what I'm doing here. So I'm, yeah, I will go into that. Uh, I'm taking the data here, well, here, and tuning the parameters. And this one, this small section here is where is the expensive, computational expensive operation. And this is always the case in machine learning. You build that, you build the model, and that part is easy. Uh, or relatively easy. Uh, you, you, you can take the sample on the data. Well, you can do things and to make it easy. The real trick, the real value of this is when you start tuning the parameters because you need to test different combinations on things. So I have here combining those parameters here, which is the threshold for the data, I don't know, the, threshold, the regularization parameter here, something that, that, uh, that I have two values here. Uh, and this one, I have two values here. And here, and I have two values here. And you say, why two values? Well, because this grows really quickly. So two values here, times two values here, times two values here. So I have four A values to explore. So, uh, uh, and I will be doing all those to see which one will give me better, um, the predictions or he, we never did this in this time but ideally this is where enters the validation data you have to train and after you have the validation data that will go and start tuning the parameters um, so this one when i was using this uh, with four cores it took like uh, between three five minutes uh, not much but uh, uh, but it will go really really uh, small if I was I were using uh, the 40 cores, for example. Uh, again, it's like 2 million values. So it will take some time to build all that. So this uh, grid builder will start exploring all the parameters or um, the four, and it will give me which are the best uh, mapping, the, the, the best parameters uh, from those uh, that increase. So here I have the true level, the prediction features, and I will be doing exactly the same. So I'm taking the true false. Now those are, let's say, the second iteration, and those. And you see here, 
before I have like 51, I think, uh, 51 uh, here, yeah. He was really, really good in, 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 in two prediction because the number of false positive was really small. I was sacrificing a little bit that, uh, well, I, I was getting three times more false positives, but now I am decreasing significantly the number of false negatives. So I am doing a trade-off here. Uh, and you see or still my precision was good. Uh, and I basically tripled my, uh, yeah, uh, triple my, my, my recall. So I am getting a more balanced model. It's able to predict better. This is really, really uh, something that you need to pay attention when you have this imbalance. When you are trying to predict things that are really uh, uh, like uh, rare event, relatively rare events, not entirely outliers, but the uh, relative rare compared with the mass of values, uh, which is the case here. So you see 400 values here. Uh, so this one plus this one, those two values here are all the negatives. This one plus this one are all the positives. So there is a different like one order of magnitude between one another. Um, so you would like to build a better uh, model for that. Uh, and that's it. Um, so this one is a more elaborated example of what the kind of things that you can do with, with the Spark, uh, especially because we build here a pipeline where we are doing many, many things. And the reason why we did this, all those steps, is because the data is very categorical. It's just names of airports, airports, distance, uh, uh, carriers, all that. Uh, in scientific data, it will be probably not so bad at this stage with the pipeline, uh, because naturally, many, in many cases, those are real numbers. Uh, on the contrary, uh, another thing here was the, the, the this grid builder uh, that was exploring many, many hyperparameters. This is in the classical machine learning things like logistic regression. This is how you do it. There is an, a similar uh, thing for deep learning. This is another thing where you also have different hyperparameters that you want to tune. And those are the most valuable things uh, they, for some reason, they usually never appear in papers. Um, uh, the, that is the goal. Uh, that is the most precious data, all those hyperparameters, how you tune that correctly. Uh, and most of the computational time goes into tuning those things. Uh, and you will see here, most of the notebook will run super fast, except for this one, where it'll take like five minutes. So. Still something manageable, but uh, but that's it. I think I am right on over the time with this. Uh, I was starting here. What I wanted that is key was this one for this defensive stocks. This was was intended more like an uh, exercise uh, uh, with something that is very numerical, so you don't have to do much. Uh, uh, trying to predict some stocks. So those are defensive stocks. So another thing that one of the, 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 the exercises, you can try to predict exactly when the Ukrainian war starts because the, the, the stocks are for, for all the defense uh, companies go to the roof and they are making a lot of money with that. Uh, so uh, you can pick. Uh, yeah, actually, you can pick that the, the, they start growing even before. Um, so that is called something into, uh, uh, yeah, well, a little bit how the world works, unfortunately. But, um, so that was more like a, a, an exercise. So it's perfectly fine to, to skip. Um, I think that is for today. Uh, it, you can take all those notebooks. Uh, you don't need any supplemental data. All the data files are already there in, in, in the input. Uh, so you can work with them. Uh, for most cases, uh, well, I think it's, uh, yeah. 
uh, I took data from here. Uh, this is a very good place to start taking data. Uh, you see, for example, it was, uh, well, plant, you put plan and they have, well, uh, you can search for data if you want something. Uh, the good thing here, more, many cases you get CSV files, so you can work with them. You can get folders with images. So if you are doing something that is closer to uh, image recognition or something, you can pick something like that. Uh, you can select large data files, small data files. Uh, they have also uh, notebooks uh, that you can pick. Let me see if I can get those. Yeah, you can pick notebooks, for example, Python notebooks. Mm, most cases they use Scikit-Learn, they use Pandas. Mm. Uh, it's more rare, they use Spark. Uh, Spark goes more into uh, really the big data domain, so uh, it's not so what is um, So they have interesting examples, especially if you are working with scientific data. Uh, it is really hard to find, at least in traditional uh, materials that are going into the housing prices, flights, and things that probably appealing to computer scientists, but not to um, computational scientists. Um, so have a look at those. I pick data from there. I pick uh, ideas uh, sometimes reconverted from pandas into Spark. Uh, and so that's a good place to start uh, learning about. OK, um, so thank you very much. Um, and that's it.